Hello guys and gals, and this is part 13 of our reading of William Goldman's The Princess Bride, A Hot Fairy Tale. Now, um, we're going to go over the copyright information as always. It's going to be on the screen. It's copyright 1973 by um, William Goldman. Um, it is, um, let me find it in the book. I can't quite remember it all. I should remember it, but I don't. Um, I need this. Okay. Here we go. All rights reserved, published in the United States by Ballantine Books, a division of Random House Incorporated, New York, and simultaneously in Canada by Ballantine Books of Canada Limited, Toronto, Canada. Library of Congress numbers there, and it says the cover art is by Norman Green. Now, in the last episode or part, um, the man in black had managed to save the princess. He basically poisoned both the cups because he was immune to iocane powder. But the um, Sicilian wasn't, so... Anyways. And now we will continue. Um, apparently, the Man in Black is now taking the princess somewhere, and we don't know where. He, he also beat Fazik, the uh, Turkish giant. Now, anyways. I was not speaking in jest. You promise? You? I should release you on your promise? What is that worth? The vow of a woman. Oh, that is very funny, Highness, spoken in jest or not. They proceeded along the mountain path to an open space. The man in black stopped then. There was a million stars fighting for prom uh, prominence, and for a moment he seemed to be intent on nothing less than studying them all, as Buttercup watched his eyes flick from constellation to constellation behind his mask. Then, with no warning, he spun off the path, heading into the wi into wild terrain, pulling her behind him. She stumbled. He pulled her to her feet. Again, she fell. Again, he righted her. I cannot move this quickly. You can, and you will, or you will suffer greatly. Do you think I can? Uh, do you think I can make you suffer greatly? Buttercup nodded. Then run! Cried the man in black, and he broke into a run himself, flying across rocks in the moonlight pulling the princess behind him. She did her best to keep up. She was frightened as to what he would do to her, so she dared not fall again. After five minutes, the man in black stopped, dead. Catch, catch your breath, he commanded. Buttercup nodded, gasping for air, trying to quiet her heart, but, there, but, they, but then they were off again with no warning, dashing across the mountainous terrain, heading where? Where do, do you take me? Buttercup gasped when he again gave her a chance to rest. Surely even someone as arrogant as you cannot expect me to give an answer. It does not matter if you, if you tell or not. He will find you. He? Highness? Prince, uh, Prince Humperdinck. There is no greater hunter. He can track a falcon on a cloudy day. He can find you. You have confidence? That your dearest love will save you, don't you? I never said he was my dearest love, and yes, he will save me. That I know. You admit you do not love your husband to be? Fancy. An honest woman? You're a rare specimen, Highness. The prince and I have never, have, and I have never from the beginning lied to each other. He knows I do not love him. Am not. Are not capable of love is, uh, are not capable of love is what you mean. I'm very capable of love, Buttercup said. Hold your tongue, I think. I have loved more deeply than a killer like you can possibly imagine. He slapped her. That is the penalty for lying, Highness. When I, uh, where I come from, when a woman lies, she is reprimanded. But I spoke the truth. I did. I, Buttercup saw his hand rise a second time, so she stopped quickly, fell dead silent. Then they began to run again. They did not speak for hours. They just ran and then, as if he could guess when she w was spent, he would stop, release her hand. She would try to catch her breath for the next dash. She was sure would come without a sound. He would grab her and off they would go. It was close to dawn when they first saw the armada. They were running along the edge of a towering ravine. They seemed almost to be at the top of the world. When they stopped, Buttercup sank down to rest. The man in black stood silently over. 
Your love comes not alone, he said then. Buttercup did not understand. The man in black pointed back the way they had come. Buttercup stared, and as she did, the waters of Florin Channel seemed to fill with light as the sky was filled with stars. He must have ordered every ship in Florin after you, the man in black said. Such a sight I have never seen. He stared at all the lanterns on all the ships as they moved. You can never escape him, Buttercup said. If you release me, I promise that you, that you will come to no harm. You are much too generous. I could not accept such an offer. I offered you I offered you your life that was generous enough. Highness, said the man in black, and his hands were suddenly at her throat. If you talk of life so so um, if there is talk of life to be done, let me do it. You would not kill me. You do you did not steal me from murderers to murder me yourself. Wise Wise as well as loving, said the man in black. He jerked her to her feet, and they ran along the edge of the great ravine. It was hundreds of feet deep and filled with rocks and trees and lifting shadows. Abruptly, the man in black stopped, stared back at the armada. To be honest, he said, I had not expected quite so many. You can never predict my prince. That is why he is the greatest hunter. I wonder, said the man black, will you stay in one group or will he oh will he stay in one group or will he divide some to search the coastline, some to follow your path on land? What do you think? I only know he will find me, and if you have not given me my freedom first, um, he will not treat you gently. Surely he must have discussed things with you. The thrill of the hunt. What has he done in the past with many ships? We do not discuss hunting, that I, that I can assure you. Not hunting, not love. What do you talk about? We do not see all that much of each other. Tender couple. Buttercup could feel the upset coming. We are always very honest with each other. Not everyone can say as much. May I please tell you something, Highness? You're very cold. I'm not. Very cold and very young. And if you live, I thought... I, I think you'll turn into hoarfrost. Why do, why, why do you pick at me? I have come to terms with my life, and that it that is my affair. I am not cold, I swear, but I am decided. But I have decided certain things. It is best for me to ignore emotion. I have not been happy dealing with it. Her heart was a secret garden, and the walls were very high. I loved once, Buttercup said, after a moment. It worked out badly. Another rich man, yes, and he left left you for a richer woman. No, poor. Poor, and it killed him. Were you sorry? Did you feel pain? Admit that you felt nothing. Do not mock my grief. I died that day. The armada began to fire signal cannons. The explosions echoed through the mountains. The man in black stared as the ships began to change formation. And while he was watching the ships, Buttercup shoved him with all her strength remaining. For a moment, the man in black teetered at the ravine edge. His arms spun like windmills, fighting for balance. They swung and gripped the air, and then he began to slide. Down went the man in black, stumbling and torn and reaching out to stop his descent, but the ravine was too steep and nothing could be done. Down, down, rolling over rocks, spinning out of... Out of all control, Buttercup stared at what she had done. Finally, he rested far below her, silent and without motion. You can die, too, for all I care, she said, and then she turned away. Wards followed her, whispered, whispered, from far, weak and warm and familiar, as you wish. Down in the mountains, Buttercup turned back to the source of the sound and stared down, as, in first light, the man in black struggled to remove his mask. Oh, my sweet Wesley, Buttercup said. What, a, what have I done to you now? From the bottom of the ravine, there came only silence. Buttercup hesitated not a moment. Down she went after him, keeping her feet as best she could. And as she began, as she, began she thought she heard him crying out to her over and over. 
but she could not make sense of his words, because inside her now there was the thunder of walls crumbling, and that that was noise enough. Beside her balance, oh, besides her balance quickly was gone, and the ravine had her. She fell fast and she fell hard, but what did that matter, since she would have gladly dropped a thousand feet onto a bed of nails if Wesley had been waiting at the bottom. Down, down, tossed and spinning, crashing, torn. Out of all control, she rolled and twisted and plunged, cartwheeled towards what was left of her beloved. From his position at the point of the armada, Prince Humperdinck stared up at the cliffs of insanity. This was just like any other hunt. He made himself think away the quarry. <coughs> it did not matter if you were after an antelope or a bride-to-be, the, pr the procedures held. held. You gathered evidence, then you acted. You studied, then you performed. It, if you studied too little, the chances were strong that your actions would also be too late. You had to take time, and, and so, frozen in thought, he continued to stare up the sheer face of the cliffs. Obviously, someone had recently climbed them. There were f um, foot scratchings all the way up a straight line, which meant most certainly a rope and arm over arm climb up a thousand foot rope was occasion um, with occasional foot kicks for balance it to make such a climb required both strength and planning so the prince made those marks in his brain my enemy is strong my enemy is not impulsive now his eyes reached a point perhaps 300 feet from the top here it began to get interesting now the foot scratchings were deeper more frequent and they followed no direct ascent, ascending line. Either someone left the rope 300 feet from the top intentionally, which made no sense, or the rope was cut, while that someone was still 300 feet from safety. For clearly, this last part of the climb was made up the rock face itself, but who had such talent? And why had he been called to exercise it at such a deadly time, 700 feet above disaster? I must examine the tops of the cliffs of insanity, the prince said, without bothering to turn. From behind him, Count Rugen only said, done, and awaited further instructions. Send half the armada south along the coastline, the other, nor the other north. They should meet by twilight near the fire swamp. Our ship will sail to the first landing possible, and you will follow me with your soldiers. Ready the, ready the whites. Count Rugen signaled the, the cannoneers, and the prince's instructions boomed along the cliffs. Within minutes, the armada had begun to split, with only the, prince, the prince's giant ship sailing alone, closest to the coastline, looking for a, land, for a landing possibility. There, the prince ordered, some time later and his ship began maneuvering into the cove for a safe place to anchor. It took time, but not much, because the captain was skilled, and more than that, the prince was quick to lose patience, and no one dared risk that. Humperdinck jumped from the ship to shore. A plank was lowered, and the whites were led to the ground. Of all his uh, accomplishments, none pleased the prince as did these horses. Uh, someday he would have an army of them, but getting the bloodlines perfect was a slow business. He now had four whites, They were, and they were identical, snowy, tireless giants, 20 hands high. <coughs> on flat land, nothing could catch them, and even on hills and rocky terrain, there was nothing short of... There was nothing short of Araby close to their equal. Um, the prince was the prince when rushed rode all four barebacked, and only when he ever rode riding one, leading three charging beasts in mid stride, so that no single animal had to bear his bulk to the tiring point. Now he mounted and was gone. It took him considerably less than an hour to reach the edge of the cliff of the, the cliffs of insanity. He dismounted, went to it, 
and went to his knees, uh, commenced his study of the terrain. There had been a rope tied around a giant oak. The bark at the base was broken and scraped, so probably whoever first reached the top untied the rope, and whoever was on the rope at that moment was 300 feet from the peak and somehow survived the climb. A great jumble of footprints caused him trouble. It was hard to ascertain what had gone on, perhaps a conference before two sets of fr because two sets of footprints seemed to lead off while one remained pacing the cliff edge. Then there were two on the cliff edge, then there were two on the cliff edge. Humperdinck examined the prints until he was certain of two things. One, a fencing match had taken place. Two, the combatants were both masters. The stride length and quickness of the foot, of the foot feints, uh, all clearly revealed to his, his unfailing eye, made his made him reason, made him reassess his second conclusion. They were at least masters, probably better. Then he closed his eyes and concentrated on smelling out the blood. Surely, in a match of such ferocity, blood must have been spilled. Now it was a matter of giving his entire body over to to his sense of smell. The prince had worked at this for many years, ever since a wounded tigress had surprised him from a tree uh, from a tree limb while he was tracking her. He had let his eyes follow the blood hunt blood hunt then then and it had almost killed him. Now he he trusted only his olfactories. If there was blood within a hundred yards, he would find it. He opened his eyes, moving without hesitation towards a group of large boulders until he found the blood. The blood drops. There were few of them, and they were dry, but less than three hours old. Humperdinck smiled. When you had the whites under you, three hours was a finger snap. He, raced, he retraced the duel then, for it confused him. It seemed to range from cliff edge and back, then returned, then returned to cliff edge, and sometimes the left foot seemed to be leading, sometimes the right, which made no le logical sense at all. Clearly, swordsmen were changing hands, but why would a master do that unless his good arm was wounded to the point of uselessness? And that clearly had not happened, because a wound of that depth would have left blood, blood spores, and there was simply not enough blood in the area to indicate that. Strange, strange, Humperdinck continued his wandering. Strange, stranger still, the battle could not have ended in death. He knelt by the outline of a body. Clearly, a man had lain unconscious here, but again, no blood. There was a mighty duel, Prince Humperdinck said, dissect, uh, directing his, his comment towards Count Rugen, who had finally caught up together with a contingent of a hundred mounted men-at-arms. My guess would be, and for a moment the prince paused, following footsteps, paused following footsteps, would be that whoever fell here ran off there, and he pointed one way, and then whoever was the victor ran off along the mountain path in almost pre precisely the opposite direction. It is also my opinion that the victor was following the path taken by the princess. She, sh shall we follow them both? The count asked. I think not, Prince Humperdinck replied. Whoever is gone is of minimal importance, since whoever has the princess is the whoever we'll, we're after. And because we don't know the nature of the trap we might be we might be being led into. We need all the arms we have in one hand. Clearly, this has been planned by countrymen of Gilder, and nothing must ever be put past them. You think this is a trap, then? The Count, the Count asked. I always think everything is a trap until proven otherwise, the Prince answered, uh, which is why I'm still alive. Um, and... With that, he was back aboard a white and galloping. When he reached the mountain path where the hand, the, the hand fight happened, um, 
the prince did not even bother dismounting. Everyone here could see, could, uh, everything could be seen quite visible from horseback. Someone has beaten a giant, he said. When the count was close enough, the giant has run away. Do you see? The count, of course, saw nothing but rock and mountain path. I would not think to doubt you. And look there, cried the prince, because now he saw, for the first time, in the rubble of the mountain path, the footprints of a woman. The princess is alive. And again, the whites were thundering across the mountain. When the, the count caught up with him, with him again, the prince was kneeling over the still body of a hunchback. The count dismounted. Smell this, the prince said, as he handed up a goblet. Nothing, the count said. No odor at all. Iocane, the prince replied. I would bet my life on, on it. I know of nothing else that kills so silently. He stood up then. The princess was still alive. Her footprints followed the path. He shouted at the hundred mounted men. There will be a great suffering in Gilder if she dies. On foot now, he ran along the mountain path, following the footprints that he alone could see, and when those footprints led the, left the path for wilder territory, he followed. Still strung, strung out behind him, the Count and all the soldiers did their best to keep up. Men stumbled, horses fell, even the Count tripped from time to time. Prince Humperdinck never even broke stride, he ran steadily, me mechanically, his barrel legs pumping like a metronome. It was two hours after after dawn when he reached the, deep the steep ravine. Odd, he said to the Count, who was tiring badly. The Count continued only to breathe deeply. Two bodies fell to the bottom, and they did not come back up. That is odd, the Count managed. No, that isn't what's odd, the prince corrected. Clearly, the kidnapper did not come back up because the climb was too steep, and our cannons must have let him know that they were closely pursued. His decision, which I applaud, was to make better time running along the ravine floor. The count waited for the prince to continue. It's just odd that the man who is a master fencer a defeater of giants, an expert in the use of iocane powder, would not know what this ravine opens into. And what is that? Asked the Count. The fire swamp, said Prince Humperdinck. Then we have him, said the Count. Precisely so. It was a well-documented trait of his to smile only just before the kill. His smile was very much in evidence now. Wesley, indeed, had not the least idea that he was racing dead into the fire swamp. He knew only once, he knew only, once Buttercup was down at the ravine bottom beside him, that to climb out would take, as Prince Hepperdink had assumed, too much time. Wesley noted only that the ravine bottom was flat rock and heading in the general direction he wanted to follow, so he and Buttercup fled along both of them very much aware that gigantic forces were following them and undoubtedly cutting into their lead. The ravine grew un increasingly sheer as they went along, and Wesley soon realized that whereas once he probably could have helped her through the climb, now there was simply no way of doing so. He had made his choice, and there was no changing, po no cha changing possible. Uh, wherever the ravine led was their destination, and, that's quite, and that quite simply was that. At this point in the story, my wife wants to know that she feels violently cheated, not being allowed to allow the scene of uh, reconciliation on the ravine floor between the lovers. My reply to her, This is me, and I'm not trying to be confusing, but the above paragraph that I am cutting into now is verbatim Morgenstein. He was continually referring to his wife, in the unabridged book, saying that she loved the next section, or she thought that all in all the book was extraordinarily brilliant. Mr. Morgenstein was rarely anything but supportive to her husband, unlike some wives I could mention. Sorry about that, Helen. But here's the thing. I got rid of almost all the intrusions when he told us what she, what she thought. I didn't think the 
device added a whole lot, and besides, he was always uh, complimenting himself through her, and today we know that hyping something too much does more harm than good. As any defeated politi political candidate will tell you, uh, when he pays his television bills, the thing of it is, I left this particular reference in because for once, it totally happened. I totally happened to agree with Mrs. Morgenstein. I think it was unfair of me to show the re I think it was unfair not to show the reunion, so I wrote one of my own. What I, uh, what I felt Buttercup and Wesley might have said, but Hiram, my editor, felt that made me just as unfair as Morgenstein here. If you're going to abridge a book in the author's own words, you can't go around sticking your own in. That was Hiram's point, and we really went round and round arguing over. I guess a period of a month in person, though, in person through letters, on the phone. Finally, we compromised to this extent. Oh, to, to this extent. This, what you're reading, is in the regular type. Is strict Morgenstein verbatim cut? Yeah. Changed? No. But I got Hiram to agree that Harcourt would at least um, print up my scene. Um, Ballantine has agreed to do the same. It's all of three pages big deal, and if any of you want to see what it what it came out like, drop a note or a postcard to Urban Del Rey at Ballantine Books, 201 East 50th Street, New York City, and just mention you'd like the reunion scene. Don't forget to include your return address. You'd be stunned at how many people send in for things and don't put the return address down. The publishers agreed to spring for the postage costs, so your total expense is is the note card or whatever. It would really upset me if I turned out if I turned out to be the only modern American writer who gave the impression that he was with a generous publishing house. They all stink. Sorry about that, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Jo Jovanovich. So let me just add here that the reason. They are so generous in paying this giant postage bill is because they fully expect nobody to write in. So please, if you have the least interest at all, or even if you don't, write in for my reunion scene. You don't have to read it. I'm not asking that, but I would love to cost those publishing geniuses a few dollars because, let's face it, they're not spending much on advertising my books. Let me just repeat the address for you, for you, zip code and all. Urban Del Rey, Ballantine Books, 201 East 50th Street, New York, New York, 10022. And, and just ask for your copy of the reunion scene. This has gone on longer than I planned, so I'm going to repeat the Morgenstein paragraph I interrupted. I'll re, uh, it'll read better over and out. At this point in the story, my wife wants to know that she feels violently cheated at not being allowed the scene of reconciliation on the ravine floor between the lovers. My reply to her was simply this. A. Each of God's beings, from the lowliest on up, is entitled to, at least, a few moments of genuine pri privacy. Oh, well, we are way over time here. We're going to have to read this later. Anyways, we've been reading from... William Goldman's book, The Princess Bride. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe, ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, all the information will be in the description below, along with the link to the Discord server. And thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.